All right, we're going to start out. Can you take one of these and pass it down? I guess take all of them and then keep one and then pass it down. We're going to get take one, pass the rest. Uh, card shuttle. Everybody should get one. Are we allowed to look? Oh, you can look at it. You can look at your card, treasure your card. Mix it with someone else's card, which obviously these are not temples. No, you're good. If you are someone who already has a card or is going to wait a little while for a card to come to you, you can open your Bible to Romans chapter 6. Um, I am really thankful to be able to spend time with you guys today. And one of the things that we want to make sure that we do is spend sufficient time looking at what God says to us in his word. And so today we're going to look at a big chunk of Romans chapter 6 to understand more of what we talked about yesterday. And yesterday we talked about one very specific thing. We talked about how the mind changes the heart which changes the will. So what you think, what you know, what you understand changes what you love and what you care about. And what you love and what you care about changes what you do, changes how you act, changes how you live. And one of the hard things about uh, a lot of how we often try to live our Christian life is we focus so much on how we live and what we're, what we're doing that we just work so hard to make sure our actions, what we do out here, line up with what God wants. And sometimes they do, and oftentimes they don't. And we find ourselves frustrated because we can't just change our actions on our own. That's what we talked about yesterday. Our actions are changed by our heart, and our heart is changed by our mind. And we're going to understand that a little bit more today from what Scripture teaches. But first, we're going to look at these cards. So does everyone have one yet? Oh, man. Where did they go? These were very, very... Oh, cool. they're still going. Very bad. Oh, they're picking special ones. Very, very badly shuffled. Oh, is shuffling is not an issue? Because, look, I already fixed it. Look at you go. What a star. But that's okay. Give it back. All right, so when you get your card, you should try and, you know, show it a little love, cuddle it, smell it, get used to its unique scent, um, appreciate it, tell it something you like about it, like, you are red, and I like that about you. I'm or, a match. I um, <laughs> yes, you found a match or something. Um, Is like nine months. Oh, They're having another time. Still going. It's still going. All right. So as they, the cards keep moving around, uh, we want to. I just want to tell you guys and parents watching at home that these cards, for some of you, will produce a reward. Now, I, I can't tell you which, which one, but there is a card, a special card in the deck. Now, it could be a two, it could be an ace, it could be anywhere in between, but uh, each card in the deck is unique and is special, but one of these cards, and they're cut in half, so there's two halves of it, one of these cards, uh, for the person who actually gets it, I will give you five dollars. I will take the money out of my pocket at the end of this chapel and I will put it in your hand um, and then you can buy me some soda. No, I mean, then you can use it for whatever you want. Uh, parents, your children did not invest any money. This is not gambling and also state of Pennsylvania. We're cool. Um, so, but this is just uh, an opportunity for us to see some things about how life works. And so each card on the outside, they're, they all, some look similar, some look different. But what we know right now is that we don't know anything. You guys have no idea what criteria I use to pick which card is going to be the card. True? Anyone want to try to read my mind? It might have been random. Oh, it might have been random. You might actually not know. Whoa. That's possible. You might not actually give us any card dollars. What? Oh, man. It could be not a card. 
Oh my goodness. I actually bet that you have the special card. Oh, I kept the card for myself. You've been looking at my financial affairs. What? Maybe all of us want and you should give us all five dollars. Yeah. Hmm. You would just split the five dollars Maybe maybe we'll talk about that. Did everyone get one yet? You got some extra? No, I'll, some I'll take them. Thanks. You guys all got them? Did you guys get a card? Would you like a card? Sure. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. You have to invest it in your college. Cards, cards. I'm good. I got five. Okay. Parents, you're obligated to invest it in something worthwhile if you win. What if the special car is in the den? Oh man, what if it's still in here? Yeah. <sighs> bloop, 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 bloop. Not worried about it. Um, okay, so I'm gonna just uh, have you guys all stand up. And I'll say a certain descriptor of a card. And when I say that descriptor, you can sit down because it's not you. All right, and the last person or people standing will be the one, the champion, the accidental winner. <laughs> so, if you have a six, you can have a seat. Wow. If you have a two, you can have a seat. If you have a diamond, you can have a seat. If you have an eight, you can have a seat. If you have a face card, you can have a seat. Or, or if you have an ace, you also can have a seat. All right, if you have a heart, if you have a spade, you can, you can have a seat. A heart or a spade. That's cool, that's cool. Don't, the joker will come up. If you have a joker, you can have a seat. Man. This is tough. Did I say if you have a three, you can have a seat? No, not yet. Or if you have a 10, you can have a seat. Are you just going to tell like, one have a seat and then I just like... Or if you have a nine, you can have a seat. You already said nine. I did? Yeah. <gasps> if you have a five, you can have a seat. No. Man. Wait, wait. Oliver, what you got there, buddy? A seven. Ooh. Oh. A seven. Ooh. Wait, were you, is anyone else still standing up here? So I guess you're, you're the last one standing, right? There's no one else standing up? You are, you are. So at the end, at the end, come up and I'll give you $5. All right. I mean, you can sit up here if you want, but um, so I just want to illustrate something or explain this illustration to you quite quickly. So a lot of you guys got a card. You might have tried to find a special card. You might have tried to find a matching card and tried to figure out what was going on in the weird space that is between my ears. but. You really didn't know what you were looking for. And now we know no, that... looking for Jesus Christ. Oh, that's true. But now we know that the particular card we were looking for belongs to Oliver. Now, what was it again, Oliver? A seven. A seven of what? Clubs. clubs? Seven of clubs? So if you have a seven of clubs, um, then you're in good shape. Now, Oliver, would you trade your seven of clubs for an ace? You don't know. What do you get if you have an ace? Nothing. So are you going to trade your seven for an ace? 
No? How about would you trade your seven for all the aces? What do you get if you have all the aces? Nothing. So are you going to make that trade? No. How about would you trade your card for all the other cards in the deck? Why not? Yeah, because the card you have gets you $5, and $5 can get you a full delicious meal at Taco Bell. And um, so uh, this is important for us to, to recognize that what Oliver knows now has changed what he loves. So Oliver knows his card is valuable, so he knows it. And since he knows it, he loves it. Well, what if you can sell all the broken cards for six dollars? If you could do that, that would be awesome, and you can try to do that if you want to. Yeah, but that, not sure that's possible. But he knows it's worth five dollars, so he loves that card. So his actions are changed. He's not willing to trade the card. He's not going to give away the card. He's not going to let you steal his card because he's a really smart guy. And so all of that comes together to say, well, you know. In real life, not just what Kelly is telling you in chapel, in real life, what you know changes what you love. And what you love changes what you do. Because before this started, I bet people thought, huh, this one with a fancy big number on it or an ace seems better than the one that's a, you know, just a boring old seven, middle of the deck, nothing important about it. You heard about crazy eights, but not crazy sevens or something like that. But what he knows changed what he loved, which changes what he does. And this doesn't just apply to silly um, card activities for us. It applies to uh, to our life as we live it in trying to follow Jesus. So, if you have a Bible, we're going to look at the beginning of Romans chapter 6. I'm going to read a huge chunk of it. Um, but I believe in you. You guys are reading comprehension geniuses. And I also believe in God, that He is a writing genius. And He is able to give us exactly what we need. And through His Holy Spirit, He's able to help us apply exactly what we need to know to our lives. So I'm going to start reading. In Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. And we're going to stop there. And this is a big chunk, and I want to let you guys know what we're doing today. We will not be able to look at all the ins and outs of what this passage says and what it means. But we're going to look at a good bit of it, and we're going to wrestle with it, and we're going to look at how God has spoken through it in a way that will change the way that we live our lives. Since this is such a big chunk, we're going to start with the last part. 
then we're going to do a little bit of working backwards. So, we'll start looking at verses 12 through 14. So if you're curious about what I'm talking about, this part is from verses 12 through 14. It tells us some things very clearly that we should not do. Do not let sin reign in your body. Do not obey sin's evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin. Now, those are huge sweeping statements. Basically, it's saying, if there is anything sinful about a thing, don't do that thing. If there's sin involved, you should not be involved. Don't let sin be in charge of you. Don't let it change the way you act, the way you live, the way you go about your business at all. If there's sin, there should be no you. That's what it's saying. Sin is off limits for you. Don't let sin rule you. Don't obey it. Don't give yourself to it. But do do some things. Do offer yourself to God. Give yourself to God. Do offer every part of yourself to righteousness. So this is a contrast here. This is a great teaching tool. Um, if I really want someone to understand what I'm talking about, um, if you imagine that we are at a pool and um, I am the world's most sunburned lifeguard, and so I got my whistle, and I'm saying, do not run around the pool. You guys like my whistle? Do not run around the pool. Do not run around the pool. Do walk, stand, sit, but do not what? Now, I gave you a contrast. I said, do something, but don't do another thing. There's a lot of things you can do. If I say, don't run, that's restrictive. But there are a lot of things you can do, right? Walk, sit, relax, talk to someone, pick your nose, point your finger. It's not a good idea, but you can do it. Um, and so that is what's going on here. Paul has given us something very clear in Romans. He's saying, here's some things you shouldn't do, and here's the other side of the coin. But why is he saying this? Why is he saying, don't let sin rule over you. Instead, you should let righteousness and a desire to please God rule over you. He ends, and the very last line of what we read said this, you are not under the law, but under grace. So I want you to notice something really significant here. We're called to live rightly. We're called to obey righteousness and not be slaves to sin anymore because of the truth about us. Notice that Paul, God in his word, he does not say, don't obey sin because if you do, you'll get in trouble. Does he say that? He doesn't say, do the right thing because God is going to give you an extra sticker. He doesn't say that. Now, God does reward his people, and God does want us to run from sin. But what he actually says here is the reason that we obey God and we don't follow sin is not because there's some um, outcome driven or because we're trying to earn God's favor or we're trying to look better in his eyes. It's because of the truth. Because we're not under the law anymore, we're under grace. And we could spend a lot of time talking about what that means, but we're going to. Just accept that as true at this point. The reason that we're told to live rightly is not because we should really be good boys and girls who God is really happy with. Instead, we're called to live rightly and to run from sin because of the truth. And so, to understand what this means, we want to rewind a little further in the passage. Does anyone have a note, notice the word that verse 12 started with where we picked up? So, what else? Therefore. Therefore. So if you see a word like so, or you see a word like therefore, what does that mean? <coughs> right. Because if there's a therefore, the people who want you to remember it say, if you see a therefore, you got to find out what it's there for. And um, that's a, a good little memory tool. Or if someone says so, that means it's the second half of a statement or the second half of an argument. Uh, if I said, the, um, you know, Oliver needs to come up to the front at the end so that he can get his $5, would you guys understand that statement if I just said 
so that he can get his five dollars? Would that statement make any sense? No, no. Well, maybe, but this would be improper. It would be improper, but it, it also wouldn't quite make sense. We need, we need to know what's, what's coming before. So, because of what comes before, we don't let sin rule in our bodies. In other words, you and I should and can honor Christ with our lives because we know that we're not under the law, but we're under grace. And it all starts with our mind. So now let's go back to verse 1. Cool? Cool. All right, so verse 1 says this, What shall we say then? Now, then is like therefore and so. But we can't stay in chapel the whole time. So if you want to read Romans 5, do that. If you don't want to read Romans 5, do that. But uh, right now we're just going to start at the beginning of chapter 6. It says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. So should we go on sinning so that God could show us more grace? No? Like a soft no? No. Uh, hard like, no. Yeah, a definite no. This is something that we're definitely not doing. There's not a question mark about it. Um, by no means. We are those who have died to sin. Who are we? People who have died to sin. We are people who have died to sin. If you're a follower of Jesus, you might be struggling with sin in your life. That's what you do. But who are you? Someone who has died to sin. This is important for us to recognize. So if we've died to sin, how can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So, that might sound confusing. It's talking about baptizing and new life and a lot of therefores, and it seems complicated, but there's a really clear truth here. Why should we stop sinning? Because we know we've been baptized in Christ Jesus and into his death and resurrection. If you look at verse 3, he says, don't you what? Don't you know? Don't you know? Um, it all starts with what you know. Don't you know that all of us followers of Jesus who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And when it talks about baptism here, it's not necessarily just talking about baptism into water. Baptism, your, your churches might look at it different a sacrament or an ordinance or as something that you do um, to commemorate or remember or as an important part of your um, your regular events and we're not going to get into the nuances of baptism but I will say this when you're baptized into something it means you're identifying with that thing that you're saying this is who I am now when someone gets baptized as a Christian it says this is who I am now a Christian. Does that make sense? It's sort of like a wedding ceremony that when I got married and I was standing um, about like right here and they started playing the music in the back. I don't really remember what song we picked or maybe it was the classic one, but I remember seeing my wife and she started, you know, coming out and then burr, 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 burr. and then uh, we stood over here and uh, our pastor stood between us and he, he asked questions like, are you going to stick with this person forever? What do you think I said? Yeah. Oh, most certainly I will. Um, and then they asked her, and she said, Oh, I will too. And I was like, yes. And it was good news. And because what she was saying and what I was saying is, I am now tying myself onto this person for life. And when you get baptized, it's a way of identifying yourself with someone else. And so when I got married, I identified myself with my beautiful wife, Jess, and that was a good decision. When I became a follower of Jesus, I was in, invited in and I was now identified as a member of God's own family, and that's even better. I love my wife. Ladies, you should all try to be like her. <laughs> Guys, there's no one else like her. Um, but we all, as followers of Jesus, identify with him. And this is what it's saying. When you're baptized into Christ, when you become a Christian, you're saying, this is who I am now. I am a follower of Jesus. I'm a child of God. I'm adopted into his family. Um, I'm, I am his 
And so, sort of like the wedding ceremony, when what it's saying here is you now identify yourself as a follower of Jesus. This is who you are now. And this is something it says that we know. Don't you know? Don't you know? Don't you know? Notice he, said, he does not say, don't you love Jesus, so don't sin. Does he say that? No. Does he say, don't you want to be good? No, he, he doesn't say that. He says, don't you know? Because, like we talked about before, what we know in our minds is the truth, our understanding, all of those things, um, changes us. We know that the truest, realest, most central thing about us is that we identify now. We have been baptized and included into new life with Jesus. And that is the truth that we know. We know. We know. Let's keep reading. Have I said we know? We know. Um, four. If we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Thank God. For we know, what does he say? We For we know that our old self has been crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. How do I become someone who's not a slave to sin anymore? Do I have to go punch Satan in the face? No. no, I just know that Jesus has won the battle for me. I know. For we know, or um, verse 8, Now if we died with Christ, we believe, believe is standing confidently in what you know, that we will live with him. For we know, we what? We know. We know, man. We know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves. Counting yourself is like saying, this is where I belong. I know this is me. Count yourselves, include yourselves. Dead to sin but alive to God in Jesus Christ. Now, this section is full of what it says we need to know. And it is full of what we need to believe in our minds, what we need to consider, what we need to count ourselves as. And it might really seem like I'm harping on what we need to know. And I am. Because if you don't know, then you can't love. And if you don't love, you can't live. Um, that's, those are the steps. If you don't really know someone, how well can you love that person? What's the difference between a friend and a best friend? You know your best friend really. You really know them. You know everything about them and they're your friend anyway. They're like, man, I've seen you. I knew you when you were a little kid, Kelly, when you, you know, go to sleepovers and wet the bed. I knew you then and I'm still your friend now. And, um, you know, I, I, I knew you when your face was one big pimple. And I'm still your friend now. The, the people who really, really know you. Um, and if you remember the card in the beginning, once you knew the truth in your mind that Oliver's card was worth the money, all of a sudden your cards became worth what? Nothing. Were you excited about your card anymore? No. no. This is how it is with sin. Once you know that Jesus is worthy and that he's great and that there's no one else who's like him and you know it, you, you really know it, then how good does sin look to you? Because Jesus can give you himself and satisfy you in himself. In fact, Psalm 16 says that in the presence of God there are pleasures forever. What can sin offer you? Pleasure for how long? Nothing. Pleasure that's how deep? Not very deep. Two inches. Maybe. Maybe two inches deep. Um, knowing the truth is the key. And we can count ourselves dead to sin because sin lies. Sin lies. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up with this point. Look at me. Sin can only lie to you. If you have Oliver's card, the seven, and you're like, ooh, this card is good, this card is right, and sin sidles up to you, and it's like, you know, that seven is okay, but an eight is bigger. And is an eight bigger? Yeah. Technically, yes. Yeah, the eight is, case, the eight is, yeah, the eight is a larger number, but which one is worth more? The seven. Which one is worth anything? See, the only thing that sin can do is it can lie to you and say, I can offer you something that's more pleasurable. I can offer you something that's more meaningful. I can offer you something that's more valuable. And those are lies. 
when we understand and when we know the truth about the glory, the greatness, the love, the presence, the power of God, all of a sudden what sin has to offer looks weak. It looks bad. And the way to start living for God and understand that He changes us is not for us to say, I really don't, I really shouldn't want to do that. I'm going to get like my anti sin muscles are going to be strong and I'm going to reject that. If you love something else, like I love my wife, so if I really, really love my wife, um, I can like reject all the other ladies. Is that because of any other reason than I really love my wife? See, um, if you really love, if you really love and understand the greatness of God, if you understand His beauty, His glory, you know it, you see Him, you understand what He did for you, then you love Him, that's natural, He died for you, He made you, He gave you life, He's with you, He sticks with you, He understands you, He is your best friend who's seen you, knows everything, knows all the stories, knows more about you than you know about yourself, and He loves you and so you love Him back, so you want to live for Him. And so I just want to wrap up saying this, when I know the truth that sin leads to death, I hate that. When I know and believe the truth that Jesus is my life, that Jesus is my reward, that Jesus is my king, I pursue that. I want that. And so I want to encourage you guys to dwell on the truth. We talked yesterday about how God renews, renews our minds, that it all starts with the mind. I, the way that God does that is by bringing his truth into our mind, especially through his word. And he shows us how good he is, how meaningful he is, how valuable he is. And everything else just looks weak. If you're a Christian who's playing games with sin, and you're saying, I love Jesus and I'm going to heaven, but you know, like, while I'm here on earth, this other relationship, this other activity, this other experience really seems to offer me more pleasure, more joy, more satisfaction than my relationship with Christ. You need to go back to your mind, because you don't know the truth. You don't understand the truth. And I have to teach this to myself all the time. I'm a 32-year-old man. I went through Chehi. Um, I went to a Christian college. I'm married to a Christian lady. I went to seminary. I've studied the Bible. And you know what? Sin still looks good sometimes. And you know what I have to do? Change my mind. I have to go back to my mind and remember the truth. Remember the truth. Remember the truth. And when I know the truth about Jesus, I love Him. I love Him. And when I love Him, and I, when, I, when I value Him, I want to live for him. Does that make sense to you guys? Let's pray together. God, we pray that you would shape what we love by what we know, and we pray that you would show us the truth about you. That you would teach us, through your word especially, who you are and help us to see you clearly. And we ask that you would help us to respond in love and that that love would motivate us to live for you. And I pray for the students here, the counselors, the staff, the faculty, myself, that we would be people who see the truth about who you are more and more clearly and so that we would see the weakness and the pointlessness and the emptiness of sin more and more clearly. And that we would run from sin and we would run to you, not just because we're not supposed to sin, but because you are so much better. Change us, God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.